we go down to this uh this spot in the river she gets turned around and we're sitting on a tailgate pretty much from the time we pulled in we just had this you know feeling that we were not alone or we were being watched it's this thing this you know creature had popped out from the woods and was was standing there I think my, my brain was telling me, you know, you're not seeing what you're seeing. And I remember it, it crossed the river and uh, we, we watched it. I remember her telling me that you can't walk through there because it's too deep. But this creature had made it across the river amongst all that and started coming up on our side of the land. It started walking towards us and we were still, I guess the word would be petrified. We were like frozen stiff. Do you mind sharing one of your dad's encounters that he shared with you? Well, um, I know he was out with some buddies. You know, they're, you know, little kids, 8, 10, 12 years old, something like that. You know, back in, you know, the late 70s, uh, there wasn't phones. There wasn't a whole lot of electronic deals. It was, you know, the outdoors lifestyle, I guess, how I grew up. But he was out with his friends. I guess he had to take a leak or what have you, and he stepped off away from the group. I don't know how far he walked in the woods or whatever, but he stepped off away from the group, and, you know, he's taking care of business, and he just said he happened to look up, and there was this big creature that was standing behind a tree, and it decided to, you know, make itself more obvious and more known, and that's when he panicked, and I guess, you know, took off running, whatever, but... And, you know, he, he always he always told me, he's like, man, pretty much zip my tally knacker in my jeans, you know, trying to get away from that thing. Because I was, you know, <laughs> so scared kind of deal. And, yeah. But uh, but there was a lot of stuff that happened. You know, I think he'd, he'd probably want to tell his story. And I walked off the path a little ways away from them, like, hey, I gotta take a leap. So I walked away from them, I don't know, 20, 30 feet into the bushes a little bit, you know, just taking a leak, and I just happened to be looking straight ahead as I'm taking a leak, and I'm like, this thing steps off from behind a tree, what I would say is about 50 to 60 feet away. And I'm standing there going to the bathroom, and this thing steps off from behind this tree, and I just froze. I just couldn't believe, like, what I was looking at. I'm sitting there staring at it, and I, I can see the anatomy, which I don't want to get into, but, and I just, I freaked, I panicked. I just took off running, screaming, monster. I ran into the house and screaming and telling my dad what I just saw. And him and his buddies loaded up a bunch of guns and went down there looking for it. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that that shocked me. They don't make people that that big. The way it moved. Uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. 
I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. This is Greg Andrews from Orlando, Florida, and you're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Longest intro ever. <laughs> Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. On Friday, I interviewed Rick, and uh, Rick shared a very terrifying encounter of being bum rushed by one of these creatures. And you heard it there in the intro. And as Rick and I spoke, he was talking about uh, his father and how his father believed him. And his father had his own personal encounter. So tonight we'll be talking to Scott. Scott's the father of uh, Rick. And Scott's going to be sharing his encounters that happened to him in Michigan. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out sasquatchchronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Scott to the show. Scott, thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, Wes. Yeah, I really appreciate you being here, Scott. And, you know, I had Rick on Friday night with uh, the members, Friday night show with the members, and his encounter was terrifying. Uh, this creature bum rushing him, and he kind of went into a little bit about your encounters, Could just kind of touched on them. I want to ask you, before we get into your encounters, where in Michigan did this happen? You don't have to give the exact location, but just kind of a rough general area of where all this took place in Michigan. Well, we lived, this was in the late 70s. We lived in uh, what would be known as rural uh, Benzie County at the time, between the uh, Upper Heron and Lower Heron Lakes. I got you. And, it, and it's, was it kind of a farm that you grew up on? It sounds like it was a big piece of property from what you and I were talking about. Well, the property itself, yeah, it was an old farmhouse. Um, it, from what I remembered of it back in the day, I think it was already 100 years old. It was a centennial type home. Um, it had several bedrooms upstairs and downstairs. Um, it was basically sitting almost right next to or adjacent to the, uh, the lower Heron Creek. And uh, kind of trying to recall, it's been a lot of years uh, yeah. since I've been back there. But it, it was it was just an extremely outlying area of Benzie County, rural Benzie County, and it was just a vast playground that we had. The woods, the gravel pits across the street. My grandpa lived across the creek. It was just all of our, the old country store. It was about a mile and a half from our house. We rode bikes there all the time. It was just a rural country setting that we grew up in. It was all of our playground. Sounds like a nice property, except for the creatures running around on the property, um, especially at the age you were at. And I know a lot of really weird, bizarre things happen around the property. Uh, before we get into that, if you would kind of tell me how all of this started, kind of walk us into the first encounter. Well, this was all over, I would say, probably a approximate time frame of about three to six months. The year would have been, oh, geez. 78 or 79 growing up in benzie county we just roamed the creeks the fields uh, played hide and go seek played tag speared fish in the creek i mean that was common thing people did it all the time and it was just a, a great country life setting and some of my best memories were always from there and we just we just had a great time tree forts old chicken coops we turned them into forts i mean us kids just we had a ball and it was all the neighbor kids my cousins whoever there might be four of us there might be 14 of us you know and uh, we just kind of roamed freely played did our thing um rode bikes um 
you know, went over in the, in the gravel pits across there because a couple of them pits, you know, had turned into basically ponds. And we, you know, we'd get uh, frog gigging. We'd uh, catch tad pollies. We, we just roamed around, you know, rode our bikes everywhere. Just did whatever we wanted. We had a, a great time. We had this old chicken coop that was just down from the house behind our house, parallel to the creek, kind of like down over a little bit of embankment footpaths everywhere because we ran it constantly. I turned this old chicken coop into a fort you know, with my dad's permission. And we were down past the, the fort plan one day and a bunch of us kids, and there must have been, I don't know, six or eight of us. And it was nothing common out of the ordinary, you know, for us kids, if we had to go to the bathroom, we just kind of walked away from the group. And it was all respected, not, and it wasn't a big deal. We just walk away, do our thing, come back, and we all go play. And I walked off the path a little ways away from them, like, hey, I got to take a leap. So I walked away from them, I don't know, 20, 30 feet into the bushes a little bit, you know. I was taking a leak, and I just happened to be looking straight ahead as I'm taking a leak, and I'm like, this thing steps off from behind a tree, what I would say is about 50 to 60 feet away. And the tree is probably like a, oh, maybe an old beech tree. Uh, it's broke off like maybe a windstorm or lightning hit it or something. It's hollowed out in the middle. It's a big tree. It's it's a big tree. And it's probably eight or ten feet tall stump, you know. And I'm standing there going to the bathroom, and this thing steps out from behind this tree, and I just froze. I just couldn't believe, like, what I was looking at. And I'm like, what in the hell is that? And I, it seemed like time passed for minutes, and it was probably only 15, 20 seconds that I was sitting there staring at it or maybe even less, I don't know, I don't recall, but I'm sitting there staring at it, and I, I can see the anatomy, which I don't want to get into, but, and I just, I freaked, I panicked, I just took off running, screaming, monster, everybody took off behind me running, they don't, they never seen it, but I just took off running for the house, and it ran into the house, and screaming, and telling my dad what I just saw, and him and his buddies loaded up a bunch of guns, and went down there looking for it. Yeah, did they ever find anything when they went back? The only thing that I remember my dad saying was something was odd down there. Um, they didn't see anything, but he saw a bunch of pin cherry trees that were somewhere around eight or 10 feet high. Um, and like he was investigating it because he was an avid hunter. He's like, something is breaking all these limbs off. Like it's bending them over to like eat the pin cherries. And that's very strange. And it's way up high. But he, you know, he never found anything when he went down there. He never saw anything. And my mom right away thought maybe it was a black bear, which black bears were not real common in rural Benzie County in the 70s. Um, I'm not saying they didn't exist at all, but they were not common. And what I saw and what I described to my dad, he's like, that kid saw a Bigfoot. And everybody's like, oh, come on. He's like, no, that kid saw a Bigfoot from what he's describing. That kid saw a Bigfoot. And, uh, you know, so my dad was having me tell him what, you know, what it looked like and everything. Can you take us back to that moment and for the audience, just describe what you saw? Yeah, sure. I mean, my dad, my dad and his buddies, okay, they're all, I'm six foot, 230 pounds. They're probably all the same size or bigger back then, ranging up to six, six, maybe. This thing was probably, it, it towered over them if they were standing next to it. I'm going to guess it was somewhere between seven and a half to eight foot tall. It had a, a lot of a human resemblance in shape, but it was not human. It was completely covered in hair. And when I first saw it, it appeared jet black. But the sun had kind of poked out from behind a cloud and was shining bright through that area of the woods for a moment. And it looked more deep, dark brown for a minute. And then the sun went back behind and it looked completely black again. But this thing was totally covered in hair. And it looked like a bodybuilder on steroids or something with covered in hair, but it had no neck and like just a cone-shaped head sitting on the shoulders. This thing was huge. I mean huge. It probably, looking back on that, I'm going to guess the thing was at least 450, 500 pounds. It was probably three and a half, four foot across the chest. It was huge. I mean, that's, that's my, my best recollection of it before I turned around and booked it. Yeah. I mean, I booked it. I was scared. I mean, it didn't seem like it was trying to harm me, but it scared the hell out of me. Yeah. It, well, yeah, that would scare the hell out of me, uh, especially being that close. Cause you know, 50, 60 feet away might sound far away, but th that's way too close to be to one of these creatures. Uh, did, did you ever get a chance to look at the face? Cause it kind of sounds like it was in the tree line. Yeah. I mean, I did, I did get a, uh, you know, a brief glimpse of the face. Um, it had a lot of human characteristic, even though a lot of the face still had 
you know, heavy hair on it, covered in hair. It wasn't as heavy as the rest of the body. Um, it had a real wide mouth. It had real dark black eyes and way bigger than a human's eyes or eye sockets. It spread further apart. Um, it had a huge head, like a bushel basket head, like huge. Um, it wasn't, I knew it wasn't a man. There was no way that that was a person. That this, this was a creature. It was an animal, you know. Um, had really long arms that went down to or past its knees. It was very muscular built. And as I took off running, I looked over my shoulder and it was walking and it went across the Heron Creek. I could hear it splash. I remembered seeing the muscles flexing its legs and its arms as it was moving. And I, it, you know, that that's, that's real. I mean, that's stuff you just don't forget. Yeah, it definitely stays with you. Um, did the expression change at all on the creature's face? The only expression that I ever saw it actually give, as far as an expression that I recall, was it blinked its eyes a couple of times. Just, and it wasn't real fast, just nonchalantly. I, looking back, I mean, I totally get the impression that we caught it off guard. I don't know if it was sleeping behind that tree. I don't know what it was doing. But it was just more like it was curious. Like, okay, who are you and where did you come from? You know, what are you doing here? Yeah, it's amazing. You know, uh, Scott, as you and I were talking uh, prior to us coming on the air, I was telling you, you know, I've interviewed a lot of little kids and I've interviewed adults that used to be kids. And it, one part that always fascinates me whenever these things are running around on people's property, it's always the kids that see it first. The adults may never see it, uh, but the kids always see it first for some strange reason. Uh, the odds are definitely in their favor. And, you know, on this property, I know a lot of weird things happen, a lot of different things happen, and we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, but tell me about your next encounter, whether it be Sasquatch related or something bizarre happened on the property. Okay, well, there was there was a total of four uh, encounter sightings that I had personally. You know, nobody else ever seemed to see this thing, which it seemed kind of odd looking back on it, but it was almost like I was singled out. But like I said, as kids used to play on the dark everywhere in the woods, across the gravel pits. And um, within a few feet of the first sighting, the second sighting had occurred. It, that one was in the dark. And I was down there. Sometimes we'd go in teams, of, you know, two kids, you know, uh, playing in the dark, you know, hide and go seek and stuff. And sometimes we'd just be by ourselves looking for six or seven others. And I'm standing there almost in about the same area, almost in the same spot of where I had the first encounter. And I'm facing more towards the creek and the brush. And I'm looking around in the dark and then moonlight stuff, you know, you can see pretty good. And I'm looking around, all of a sudden I heard something right in front of me. And it's probably the only 30 to 40 feet, or maybe not even that far. And all of a sudden this thing appeared and you could see the complete silhouette of it standing with the moonlit night. You could see it standing there. And I'm like, I just kind of froze for a second. And it just, it, it was dead silence between us. Nothing going on. You couldn't hear no crickets, no nothing. And all of a sudden, it, it made some noise. And then it turned around, and I, I, I remember it plain as day. I knew it went across the creek because I heard the sploosh, sploosh across that creek. And some of those holes were, you know, four or five foot deep, or maybe even more in some of the bends where they washed out, you know. And uh, immediately, I just took off running. I was like, oh, my God, there it is again. And uh, But it just caught me off guard, and I don't think it knew that I was there. And if it did, I don't know, but there it was suddenly out of nowhere. And I mean, it stood out in the moon that night. It was unreal. Did it ever vocalize at you? I mean, you said it made yeah. some noise. What, what did yeah, it? Yeah, it did. It, it wasn't anything bellering loud. It was like more of a mumble, low pitch, um, but very deep. And it was just kind of a, ooh, ooh. And I, and I, like I said, I was standing there frozen stiff, like, whoa, you know? And it turned around, spun around, and it splooshed right across that creek, you know, in the darkness and was gone that fast one of the things I, i'm fascinated by this and I'm, I'm curious do you think it was the same creature you ran into before or do you think it was a different one obviously you may not know but i'm just yeah. curious on your opinion well that one i believe in my own personal opinion and perspective that one was the same one that i saw the first time although i know i've seen two different ones in those encounters that i had that one i believe was the same one and tell me, so you, I would imagine you run back to the house at this point? Yeah, I was. I, I wasn't even looking for the kids. I just hightailed it down the footpath and right back up to the house. So you go back to the house, and do you talk to your dad again about what happened? 
No, actually, that time, from what I recall, my dad wasn't there that night. Um, I think my older sisters were watching us, and us kids were just out playing. And when I ran up there and told my sister, you know, I think it was my oldest sister, I said, hey, I just seen that thing again. She's like, oh, knock it off, you know, you're seeing things, and so someone scared you or whatever. And I'm like, no, i seen it again, you know, and she's like, no, you didn't see nothing. Get back outside and play, so... Yeah, and during this time, between these two encounters, was there anything going on on the property as far as animals being killed or anything have like vocalizations in the woods, or was there anything that seemed odd at, at this point? There was. There was There was so many incidents that I had to kind of make note of them. Um, there were several incidents, that, weird things that were going on, and one of them was the neighbors um, just up the creek. Um, up the road, just about 500 feet or less from where we lived. And we play with their kids all the time. They play with us. We all hung out. But they called my dad one time at like 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock in the morning. And back then we all had a shared party line, that kind of thing. But they called my dad and woke my dad up and wanted my dad to come down there. Um, apparently her husband was out of the town working or something at the time. And whatever was going on down there, this thing's screaming, making all kinds of noise. And it's got my dogs all freaked out. My kids are freaked out. I'm freaked out. Jim, can you get down here and help us? We don't know what's going on. And I remember my dad getting up and loading up some guns and throwing them in his pickup and a couple of flashlights, and he was heading down there. Um, I don't know whatever transpired with it. I really don't recall. But we also had a couple of pigs in a pig pen out behind the house, uh, a short distance from the house that my parents were raising to butcher. And we were home one night, everybody sound asleep in beds. And there was all this screaming and commotion going on. And it just startled you when you woke you up, like what in the hell is going on? And my dad jumped up and I remember him being downstairs. I was sleeping upstairs at the time because I refused to sleep downstairs because what I'd saw in the window, but my dad was loading some guns and he's like, stay inside, stay inside. I don't know what's going on with the pigs, but stay inside. And so we're all trying to peek out the window. He's out there with a flashlight looking around. And after a few minutes, he comes back in and he's all panic stricken. My mom's like, what's wrong? What the hell's going on? He goes, I don't know what the hell's going on, but something tried to get one of them pigs. It's all scratched up. My mom's like, what do you mean it's all scratched up? He goes, no, it's scratched up. Like something tried to reach over the pen and grab it. Something uh, was trying to take it. And it was fighting because when I got out near them, the pigs wouldn't have nothing to do with me. They kept running to the opposite side of the pen. And the pigs were used to all of us, you know. So uh, my dad never could only attribute it to one thing. And my mom's like, oh, come on, I'm not so sure, you know, you know what you're talking about. My dad's like, I'm telling you, and there's not, bears are not common around here. And the only thing it could be is a Bigfoot trying to get one of them pigs. And uh, my mom's like, okay, well, whatever, you know, then my mom would just believe him. Okay, that's fine, you know. If that's what you think it was, what are we going to do about it? My dad's like, well, I don't know, really know what to do about it. But you know, I went out there, did the best I could and calmed them down. But they did end up taking those pigs there a short time after and got them butchered because my dad's like, whatever tried to get those pigs, probably would try to come back again. And I'm not going to lose the pigs. So we'll just take them and get them butchered. Down the road a little ways from us, my grandpa had a pig pen way back in the woods where my mom and dad commonly hunted deer a lot. And uh, there was a couple of houses way back that two track easement that went back into a piece of property like 20 30 acres back there and then back behind that in the woods my grandpa had a great big pig, uh, pig pen where he bred pigs and butchered them and all that stuff my grandpa was quite the character um he had an incident where he where he came tearing in the driveway one evening in the dusk hour uh, right right coming into dark and my grandpa was a fearless individual i mean he was the best grandpa you could ever ask for but he was fearless as the day is long i mean this guy was tough and he come ripping in the driveway. And him and my dad were close. They were best buds. And my dad kind of jumped his ass. And he's like, man, what the hell are you driving for that, like that? You know, you got the grandkids around here? And he's like, Jim, get your gun. My dad's like, what? And he's like, get your gun. Something's trying to get my pigs. And it scattered off through the woods. And I spooked it. And it took off running. And I don't know what it is, but it's big. My dad's like, what? And he's like, get your guns now. I need you over there now. My pigs are raising hell and carrying on. And uh, so a bunch of us went over in the pickup. My dad's like, boy, it went right down through here, whatever it is, because the leaves were all tore up and limbs were busted off the trees and just like something plowed through there, you know. And my grandpa was rattled. My grandpa never went back to that pig pen again without his 30-30 lever action, ever, ever. They never did see anything, but my grandpa was rattled beyond rattled. So 
Yeah, it's amazing. And even your mom eventually uh, figured out something was going on around the property. I know Rick kind of went into it. And I, I want to get to your other encounters, but what kind of changed your mom's opinion as far as maybe there is something going on here? Well, once she had found the footprint outside the house, at the corner of the house, the one corner of the house, um, and tried to save it and took some pictures like from an old 35 millimeter. She was trying to, I think my dad might have had to work on a Saturday or Sunday, and she was trying to preserve it for when he got back there. She wanted him to see it. And uh, I knew, looking back on it, at that point, my mom then was convinced because this print was so big and it had so much definition that there's nobody with a foot that big. And if we stepped alongside of it and she even took pictures with an old tape measure to try to you know show how big the print was, and even our print next to it was midgeted or dwarfed next to it um, and how wide it was and how long it was, the whole nine yards and, how, and it was sunk in the, in the, into the sand and ground there, like, you know, probably a good half inch. And we couldn't even leave a foot impression standing next to it. I know that my mom, my mom then was a complete believer there. Was, and I've talked to her about that a couple of times over the years as an adult. And she's like, oh yeah. She's like, there ain't no doubt in my mind. That's, you ain't never seen me going in the woods without a gun again, ever. Yeah, and then while all this is going on, you had a few more encounters, and you were talking there about it coming up to your window. Was that the next time you had actually seen the creature? No, that was during during the course of all this going on in my four actual encounters. The the bedroom that I was sleeping in off the back of the corner of the house uh, in, in the main level faced the gravel pits in the, in the highway, but it was always, it seemed like the moon was always up bright on that side of the house. And I remember, you know, us kids, me and my brother or something, we just lay in bed and talk and that kind of thing. Share a bed, you know, back then it was pretty common. And uh, sometimes we'd talk ourselves to sleep, you know, the two of us, whatever. But that window, even though it had one of those old pull-down style shades back in the day, if someone was to walk past it, and then with the moon at night, I mean, you could see their silhouette like nothing. And this was all going on in the same time frame it would stop and like stand there and you could see it plain the day, the complete outline silhouette of it. And I would just pull the covers up over my head. Like, what the hell is that? There it is again. And, uh, and you know, sometimes when I would pull the covers back after a couple minutes, it'd be gone. You know, sometimes it was still there, you know, and I just refused to sleep in that bedroom. I didn't want no more to do with it. My mom wouldn't believe me. My dad did. And he went out there a few times looking, he couldn't find anything, but I'm like, it keeps looking in the window, whatever it is, stands in front of the window. Do you think it saw you? I mean, do you think when it was looking in the window, it was looking right at you? I don't know if it was necessarily looking right at me as much as it might have been trying to look through the window because we used to have those old pull-down style shades, and if you let them go, they just up to the top, you know? Uh, and it would have been hard to see through something like that, but I think it might have been being curious because it was a main level. It was trying to look in the window, but I don't know they could actually ever see me or see us, you know? I got gotcha. you. Well, tell me about the next uh, incident that took place on the property. Well, I was run down along the Heron Creek uh, with some other kids, and we we were spooking fish and chasing fish up and down the uh, down the creek there. And I call it a creek, but it was quite wide. It just was shallow for the most part in a lot of the areas other than the bends. And uh, I was chasing fish up and down the uh, creek with, with these other kids and my cousins made my brother, a bunch of us and it varied, you know, from time to time who all was there, but I was going down to a certain spot. I'm like, you guys, uh, throw rocks in that hole back there and the fish will come down out of that hole. If there's any in it, they'll come right through these shallows and we'll be able to see them. And we throw rocks at them and play and have fun, you know? So I went booking it on down the creek, you know, maybe 50, 60 yards into the in a good part of the shallows where I knew they'd come through there. If they threw the rocks in there and I come right to a stop, I'm like, whoa there it is again and it was standing but it was standing with his back towards me in the creek and i know yet today even looking at it it was eating fish because they had one in its right hand and i want to say it was an old sockeye salmon or a sucker but i don't remember i want to say it was a sockeye salmon and it was kind of fungusy but it had it in its right hand and when he brought it back down the head was gone and then it had it was kind of bent over and it was looking with its left hand like moving around the water like it was trying to grab a fish and uh, I just kind of froze. I just locked right up. I just come right to a stop. Like, whoa, here it is staying right in the creek, you know, in the broad daylight. And uh, you can see the complete back, the buttocks, the legs, the arms. And that one, I'm pretty sure, was the same one that I saw in the first two encounters. Because it was only about, I would say, five, five and a half to six feet tall. It wasn't 
nearly as tall, nearly as big and broad as the other one that I had seen before, twice. Um, so that was, you know, a, a separate encounter. But I just, I, after I froze and stood there for a few seconds, I just turned around and booked. And then when I got to the other kids, I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's get out of here. And, you know, they're all like, why, why? So let's just go. And we ran, started heading the opposite direction, looking for fish and farting around doing our thing, you know. But I just, it, it shocked me because it, there it was. And I never expected to see it standing in the creek. Yeah, it's fascinating that it's a smaller one than the one. It was, saw. it was too. It was, it was probably, it was probably at least two to three feet shorter than the first original one that I'd seen twice. It was that much shorter. Was there a um, a different color to it? Because the first one was kind of a black or dark brown. Did this one kind of have the same color pattern? Yeah, similar, but it was more completely brown in the broad daylight. Um, and the angle I was looking at, it was it was just a dark dark brown. It was no black feature to it whatsoever. That's terrifying, man. Especially running into it on you know this is where you're playing. This is your home. And you're running into this thing. I realize it's not coming after you to kill you, but uh, it still is terrifying to see one. You know. Well, I don't think the thing even knew that I ever knew that I was there because the, being in the shallows and where it was at and everything, standing, I don't think it ever knew from the water rushing through the noise of the water. I don't think it ever knew that I was there, and I I didn't stick around very long. Like I said, it was just seconds, maybe maybe even ten, fifteen seconds. I seem like times always stand still when you run into one of these things, but. Uh, I don't think everybody knew I was there. I think it was too intent on fishing and eating or whatever it was doing. It was the nearest thing I could figure. It was eating. Uh, it never even knew I was there. There's a lot of eyewitness accounts of them kind of doing what you're describing. Uh, recently, I did a few shows where the eyewitness was talking about it had its hand in the water and was kind of moving it around almost like it was looking for a fish. And I mean, your description is identical to what I've heard in the past. With all this going on, tell me about your, your last encounter. Well, the last encounter really was basically my, to me, the most frightening. And I'm not sure exactly why, other than, other than the fact of what I had come across in general with that sighting and, and the incident encounter. Um, we were playing over in the gravel pits. Again, we were, one of the times we were just playing hide and go seek, a whole bunch of us kids. And... We were, and we were, I was, you know, looking for the other kids at this point. And we were over in the dark, kind of a moonlit night. You could see pretty good. And uh, this is late at night, probably, you know, 9, 10 o'clock at night. And I'm looking around in the dark, and I'm being quiet. And they might be hiding behind a tree, or maybe they're standing on top of one of the sand knolls, gravel knolls, or something like that. You never knew where to find somebody exactly. And uh, I remember kind of looking over to my left, like, you know, 40, 50 yards. And I'm like, oh, well, there's like three or four of them or two or three of them or whatever didn't want to play must decide not to play hide and go seek so oh heck it i'll just go join them you know and so i start kind of heading that way and i get about halfway of that distance between me and them and i realized them wasn't them and i, I kind of come right to a stop because i seen something standing on the bank up above them 10 to 12 feet and here it was it was a bigfoot sasquatch and you could see the complete outline in the moonlit night of it standing there and what was down below it was infants running around. I thought they were kids. And I, I mean, I just stood there like, Whoa, am I really seeing what I'm seeing? And all of a sudden the infants kind of stopped and paused and was watching me. And then they went back to playing. But the whole time, the, I don't know if it was a she or a he, I'm not, I'm not sure if it was a male or a female was standing on top of that knoll watching me and then looking to its right where the infants were running around playing. And then it would look back and forth at me and look at them, look at me, look at them. And I just froze. I was there several seconds, maybe 10, 15 seconds. And I just started backpedaling, backstepping. I turned around and started running. And I just run for the house. I never did see where the kids went. Um, and I got back to the house. They were all at the house playing. They must have just decided not to, you know, play hide and go seek anymore. But I thought when I saw them running around, jumping around, playing around, I thought that was some of the kids from our group. And it wasn't. It was not. It was infant Bigfoot Sasquatches is what it was. That and that that's something I never told nobody for a long time because everybody was thinking I was crazy. And what I had encountered then was to me like the most scariest because this wasn't just one of them. There's three or four little infants running around the ground and a great big one standing on the knoll, sand knoll. That one scared me the worst. 
Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. I want to ask you, how, so how old are you at this time? Because you say infant, but you kind of thought that they were your, you, the kids you were playing with. I mean, you thought that, were they about the same size? Yeah, they were basically like the same size as me. I was probably, I was either eight or nine years old, right in that category, 78 or 79 when this was all going on. And I was either eight or nine years old. I was born in 70. So, and these things were my size. I thought it was just other kids until I got halfway in that distance, you know, and closed half of that distance of running over to like, Hey, what you guys doing? And I realized that that's not other kids, you know? And you described the, the playing, can you, what were they doing? What were the smaller ones doing that made you well, think that they were playing? They were kind of running around in circles and one of them was trying to jump up like on its shoulders. Like we, you know, you, you play checking his kids and you jump up on each other's shoulders and just horse horse play, just horse play in general. And that's, I thought it was other kids. You know, if you run it, you know this, Scott, if you run into a black bear and it has its cubs, you're practically a dead man. If you run yeah. into a cougar and it <coughs> it's, has its babies, you're practically a dead man. And what's fascinating is with Sasquatch, every time I've ever interviewed someone and the adults are there and then also the smaller ones are there, they don't quite to se seem to react like a, a wild animal would, you know, because you know, I'm going to kill you. You're a predator. And these are my, you know, they don't seem to react that way. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And, and looking back on it as an adult now, it's like it, it never posed a threat. It never seemed intimidating or trying to threaten me or harm me. But I'm really shocked because, like, when you say, like, you know, you try to get between a mother cub and it's, uh, a cub, an old tiny cub and its mother, a bear, you're putting yourself in a bad situation. But it never seemed like it was just monitoring me, watching me. I didn't wasn't posing a threat, and so it wasn't bothered by me, you know. But at the same time, I'm kind of shocked and appalled looking back on it that I wasn't brutally attacked or something, you know. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not a researcher. I don't have one in a cage. And, but all the homework that I've ever done on them, it just it catches me off guard that I wasn't put in any kind of detrimental situation. I was really surprised by that, you know, looking back on it. You know. Yeah, I mean, they were obviously watching. They'd probably seen you more than you'd actually seen them. Um, what, why, why do you think that they, I know we're speculating here, but why do you think that they were running around on that property? You know, I never figured that out as a kid. And even in my younger adult years, you know, I pondered on it many times up till now, even the only thing that I've ever come up with is that because of all the bodies of water, the creek that ran between the two lakes that we lived on. And otherwise that with all the fish in the creek, that kind of thing, I think it was just where they lived and were breeding um that's it was their feeding grounds um the swamps were maybe where they slept that's the only thing i've ever come up with that was just where they lived yeah it's a lot of resources you know? yeah as far as anything else going did anything else ever happen on the property well i'm trying to recall because there was so many bizarre incidents that had taken place the only thing i really do recall i i wasn't actually there that my dad and my grandfather were out poaching one night and uh, they did that a lot. I mean, that was very common. That's how they fed the families and probably half the county. But they come back, and my grandpa wasn't a real big drinker, but my dad ended up having a few beers while they were out poaching. And they were both having this conversation, and they were both, like, in an appalled state of mind. And uh, I remember coming down to go to the bathroom uh, from the upstairs, and they were in the kitchen. And uh, they, were, they were having this conversation i don't know what the hell that was and my dad's like well i shined the light on it but i th and you were looking at something different with with you know and i was trying to shoot that deer but i seen what was over there and I'm, i was trying to make sense of it all but they were talking about something they had seen when they were out poaching deer and they cut hit it with a spotlight and when they come back like what the hell was that it was it was gone it was going into the brush and they like that was a bear that thing was standing upright and it was walking on two on two legs two feet and they were both having this deep conversation about it, like they were just in total shock. But uh, other than the other incidents and stuff that I had mentioned you know, already, I mean, there was just so much bizarre stuff going on. I, I think that's about the last one that I recall ever going on around there, you know. So Yeah, and it's a lot to take in for a kid, you know, seeing something like this. And it definitely changes your life. I hear people all the time saying, I want to see a Sasquatch. And I, you know, internally, I think, no, you really don't. But that's my yeah, opinion. You know, you know, and all that stuff that happened back then, I mean, I had a couple, 
I can't really say they're positive encounters as an adult, you know, in the last 15 years, but all that stuff that had happened back then was just so bizarre. I mean, because like Bigfoot wasn't commonly talked about or Sasquatch. And I knew, you know, my dad was, you know, a believer and avidly into it quietly in his own way. Um, but it wasn't something that was widely talked about. I'd never seen the Patty film. I don't think I ever saw that till I was 14, 15 years old, maybe even older when VHS was out, that kind of thing, you know. But um, it, it was really, really strange and bizarre beyond what most people would want to comprehend or believe. Yeah. Well, they're definitely real. How did, how did it affect you throughout your life, you know, of, of, of these experiences as a kid? Well, I think it made me a little bit of a recluse to some people. And I think it made me a little bit of rough and abrasive to some people because like, you know, my wife would bring it up, you know, we were out with some friends or something and she'd be like, yeah, you know, my husband saw Bigfoot when he was a kid and, and they'd be like, what? I'm like, yeah, man, you either believe or you don't. But once you see one, I'm going to tell you right now, you will be a believer. And if you don't want to go into this conversation, then just back away now. You know I mean? I, it, because it, people just didn't have to me enough of an open mind to comprehend or understand that these things really exist and they're out there. So it, I, I mean, it kind of put me on, on edge with a lot of people. Like we can either go here or we can't. Yeah, it, it is like that. Especially it's, you know, an encounter is something very personal. And when you, um, you know, share that with someone and then the response is you're nuts or they laugh at you, uh, it hurts, you know, it really hurts. Did you, um, did you ever get a chance to talk to your dad later in life regarding what was going on there? Yeah. Yeah, I did actually. Um, well, a couple of them was on his deathbed, but through the years, you know, we'd like have coffee or something like that, you know, once in a while and nobody else would be around because you're talking about two people that believe so we can talk freely. And he's like, Oh yeah. Oh yeah. He goes, I, I know you seen what you seen. There ain't no doubt in my mind. And, and he'd start telling me about the encounters that him and my mom would have when they were back there near that pig pen area that my grandpa had. And they used to hunt back there. And, uh, you know, we touched on a lot of the uh, topics, you know, from time to time over coffee, my dad and I would, when nobody else was around, maybe once in a while, my wife might've been, but mostly when nobody else was around and my mom and dad, you know, at this point, by this time, had already divorced and separated years ago, but, we'd have, you know, brief conversations about it. And he's like, oh yeah, yeah, they're out there. These people that don't believe in them, they're nuts, you know, and I know they exist. And I know what you saw back then, ain't a doubt in my mind, you seen what you saw. And, you know, it was always comforting with my dad because my dad was completely on board with it. He knew they exist. So, you know, we had over, over the course of, you know, 30 years or so, uh, before he passed or anything, but we, we had you know, brief chats about it from time to time, you know, so. Yeah. And I would imagine too, you know, being a kid, I feel so, I feel bad for you because here you are, you can't even sleep in your bed and you're seeing this thing walking past your window at night, which is pretty common for, for a lot of eyewitnesses I've spoke to now that are adults or are still kids of them yeah. coming up at windows. And that would terrify me, especially being a kid. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's it scared. It scared the shit out of me badly. I mean, I was I was like, I'm not sleeping in that room anymore. I don't care where I have to sleep. I am not sleeping in that room. It showed me to the bone. You know, you pull your head off from under the covers and peek, and it's there. And or and it wasn't a minute ago, and now it is. And or two minutes later, it's still standing there. And all of a sudden, you can see it slowly walk away. I mean, plain as day, looking in the moonlit night through that curtain and that shade, you can see it. You know, I'm like. Your eyes don't, your eyes don't fool you, dude. You know, they just don't fool you. So, well, and then you know there was, saw. there was even evidence of it. You know, your mom found the track. Well, my dad found all the pin cherry trees, you know, several feet up, you know, that none of us kids could reach. He couldn't even reach them. And he was six foot, you know, six foot, I think six foot one. And he's like, whatever this is, is really tall. You know, and there's only one thing I know that it could be. So. Yeah, when Rick was telling me his encounter, you know, it's it's nice to have someone to talk to who's actually seen it, and for him to come talk to you it, throughout your life. You know, you leave this property. Did anything else ever happen to you throughout your life as far as running into these things? Yeah, you know, I had a couple encounters. Uh, what I call encounters. I mean, I didn't have a positive ID. I'm going to say that flat out foremost. Um, I'm not going to sit here and elaborate and manufacture or fabricate on something that I didn't see. 
but I had a couple of encounters in different properties that I had hunted, basically like other private properties. Um, and I had, I was the only one that had access to the property to be able to hunt it. And I was sitting in my blind one time and, uh, I used to take my wife and kids back here in this same property, coincidentally, and many times squirrel hunting, deer hunting, all that stuff, set up blinds for everybody and, you know, enjoy it as a family. But I was sitting back in the blind the one morning and I was usually a lot of time I'd be back in my blind, even though we couldn't shoot till seven thirty, eight o'clock and legal shooting hours. I'd be sitting back there having coffee, um, just hanging out, being quiet, just observing the woods. I like being in the woods. And uh on about daybreak comes, I'm drinking coffee real quietly and smoking my cigarettes and I'm real observant. I, I get everything right down to a detail when I'm hunting deer. And I'll I'll observe and anything is out of place, I will notice it immediately. And I was sitting there, and all of a sudden, I went to light a cigarette, and I froze. I kind of had my head tucked down into my chest a little bit, so, like, you know, something couldn't see me move a deer or something, you know. And I froze, and I'm like, I got this eerie feeling. And I'm like, oh, shit, I'm being watched. I know what it is. And I pulled my head up real slow, and I'm looking to my left and scanning with my eyeballs as much as I can, trying not to move. And I'm looking to my right real slow, and I'm scanning back and forth, back and forth. And I couldn't see nothing. I couldn't smell nothing. I couldn't hear nothing. But everything was like dead quiet, like eerily quiet. And up out of this one valley um, off to my left, uh, there was a lot of rolling hills terrain back in there. Here comes this doe, like a yearling doe, hauling ass out of nowhere. And it actually spooked me. And I'm like, whoa, where'd she come from? And this thing come running right up, stood right beside my ground blind. It was a raised blind, enclosed blind. And I had shooting windows out of and it stood there so close that I could have reached out with my seven mag and this was a real custom gun that I was using at the time I could have just reached out and bonked her in the head and it, she like she didn't even know I was there but she was staring off into that valley and I'm like okay what's what spooked her what the hell's going on here and I'm so I carefully pull up my seven mag custom setup very long barrel and I'm looking out through my custom scope and I'm looking, this gun's really heavy, so I had to get it balanced out good. And I'm looking, and I'm, I said, what in the hell is down in that valley about 200, 250 yards? And then about that time, as I spotted that movement, off to the left a little further, closer, was a bunch of deer hightailing it coming up towards me. And I'm like, so I'm zooming in, I've seen those deer, and now I'm losing focus on even deer hunting. I'm more focused on this eerie feeling and what the hell is going on here. And so I'm looking down through this Vedata scope, custom scope I have, and I'm looking down through the woods and through the branches, and all I could see was a silhouette figure of what I, at first I thought was another hunter in, like, camouflage or a ghillie suit. And I'm looking through this scope, and immediately I'm like, that's not a hunter. Oh, okay, baby, give me a headshot. Just go ahead and poke your head out. I know what you are. And, and it kept moving through there. It would never stop. It was just moving real slow. But all these deer were scattering, running up towards me. But I had always had, for a long time now, I've had that attitude. We'll pause here for a second. That if I ever encountered one, bad choice or not, it's my right to choice. This thing poses a good shot. And I'm not no marksman specialist here, but I'm a damn good shot. If this thing ever pokes its head out, I'm going to take it right between the eyes. And I'm going to prove that these things exist. Well, this thing never did come up out of there, and it traveled right on down through that valley on an angle, and it kept right on going. And then it disappeared where I couldn't even see any movement. But all those deer had ended up coming up right by my blind, within a few yards of my blind, and we're all standing there panting. You could see the steam coming out of their nose. It was cold out in deer season. And eventually, they just kind of trotted off behind me after they stood there for several minutes and get, you know, collected their thoughts or whatever they were doing. And when I'm behind me, I didn't, you know, I never, I just lost focus on it at that point, because in my mind, I knew what it was. There was no doubt. Yeah. And, you know, it's fascinating. You hear a lot of hunters talk about, uh, I've had a lot of them on the show, actually, and they'll, they'll talk about um, being in a tree stand or being in a blind and the deer run right to it, <laughs> you know, come running right up to the, the stand and we'll sit there. And, you know, the even though deers aren't the smartest things on the planet, you would think that they know you're there. I mean, there's guys in tree stands that'll run right up to the, the ladder of the tree stand and sit there and rest for a second. It makes you wonder if the deer 
you know, because they're naturally afraid of us, it makes it makes me wonder if they think, well, this is a lesser of two evils, so I'm going to run to this hunter. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I really don't know how to speculate on that one because I think the deer were so scared that I don't even know if they knew I was there. Yeah, did you ever give up hunting? Were you like, I've had enough of this? No, you know, from an early age of my first encounters, I always took the attitude that they never tried to harm me. And I know there's different types from doing some homework, but they never tried to harm me. But one thing I always told myself is I'll never go in the woods again without a gun, ever, ever, period. Um, that's, that's one, one position I always took. I'm not going to let this thing, this creature stop me from what I enjoy. But however, I will make people aware of it. And if they don't want to believe me that it exists, that's up to them. Yeah. I don't blame you for wanting to pick one off. Uh, I yep. wish somebody, and I always get nasty emails when I say this, I wish somebody would and, you know, cut the head off, bring it in and let's, well, let's put an end yeah. to this, you know? Yeah, because, you know, I had one other encounter after that, a, di a different deer blind than the property I was hunting. But, you know, I took the attitude and position for many years for the hoaxing that they claim goes on, all this other stuff. I took the attitude, you know, that it, it's going to definitely take a body to prove it. To, and, and some people would even still try to dispute it. But here it is sitting in front of me. You know, the feds are probably going to get in it, involved in it, cover it up, whatever. But here it is sitting in front of me. You come see it. Now you tell me I'm a liar. And I knew with several of the weapons that I have, especially that 7 Mag and how that's set up, that is a sniper set up for shooting off benches and shooting prone. This thing is a 1,000-yard weapon the way it's set up. And I know I've shot 600-yard shots and be able to hit top balloons. This thing's accurate. So I'm like, I may not have enough, enough cannon behind it to some degree, but this thing, if you hit him in the head, just like that one episode you had where the guy shot one, took it down, um, and it shot it right in the head with a 30-06. I'm like, this has got more punch than a 30-06. And this will fold him on a headshot. And I'm only going to go for a headshot. But don't hold, hold still for too long because this is a tack driver. I mean, this thing was dialed into point zero one and point zero three at the worst on the cartridges. These are special hand loads. I knew what the weapon was capable of. I'd shot 11 deer in one day one time with it. Just slide the bolt, look for the next one. But I've always been convinced, and this is my own thinking, this isn't anything I got from anybody else, any of your shows, any, any other research, nothing. It's always been my position that if I ever come across one, I will take it out. Just to prove. It's not because I want to end them. It's not because I want any other kind of controversy or debate to come into play. It's just because I can say, here it is, world. Here it is right in front of you. You have the opportunity. You come observe it for yourself. Now you tell me. Yeah, and and I agree with you on that. And I think that's the government's partly to blame for that. You know, I think that they. Oh, don't even get me started on the government. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, the, the news always, they'll do stories on Bigfoot, but it's always with a smirk and a wink. And I think they've created that environment, you know. So yeah. people who are out there who are upset about someone who wants to kill Sasquatch, uh, well, you know, they, they should change the, the environment as far as how, how the subject is treated. And mm -hmm. if it did come out that whatever they are, whatever the creatures actually are, are proven to be real to mainstream science, then yeah, if, and it, I, it, yeah, go ahead. If, if that happened, then they would, there'd be no need for people to go out there and shoot them. You know, I, yeah, did, I, I doubt very few people would. Well, you know, and I don't want to send anybody into a frenzy, you know, by my, my position with it because I don't want people just going out here looking for them and putting themselves in possible harm's way or danger, you know, but it's there again, I couldn't even begin to emphasize enough that I know in my mind, my frame of mind, um, I've been in Alaska. I've been all the United States. I've been some of the worst parts of Canada, the most outlying parts of Canada you could ever imagine. I've been around grizzlies. I've seen grizzlies that were 12, 1500 pounds. And many records were taken even during a time frame when I lived in Alaska as a kid. You know, a, a, a Bigfoot against a Sasquatch Bigfoot against a grizzly, the grizzly don't stand much of a chance. Man, but the government covering all this kind of stuff up, oh, it does, you know what? Be careful going down that rabbit hole with me because I'm not a government guy. I don't trust the criminal justice system. They're all in cahoots. Uh, there's a lot of corruption, a lot of cover ups, conspiracies. Where do we want to start with that one, Watergate or, you know, JFK, you yeah. know, but uh, the, the government, 
so I, I just kind of, a lot of time I leave a lot of that out because if I ever see one, I'll take one. I'm going to prove it, you know? Yeah. And I don't blame you for having uh, that attitude. And we can talk about the government cover up if you want, but would you talk about your Absolutely. last, would you talk about yeah. your last encounter? Okay. Well, this, this happened a few years back and uh, the guy that I was friends with at the time and him and I don't really hang out much anymore, but uh, it's only by, you know, some, situations that have happened, but I was hunting on his property at the time. And I was one of maybe three guys at the time that was even allowed to hunt that property. And there was some stipulations like, you know, you couldn't take anything less than a six point buck. Um, and it's very end of season. He might allow me to take a couple of does to fill a doe tags. You know, he knew that we were into canned venison and all that stuff. And he respected it. He was too, but he wanted to keep the bucks real healthy in his property. So, you know, he, he, he only trusted certain people to go back there that he knew would honor his rules per se. So I'm sitting in this one of his blinds that he set me up and he said, yep, this is cherry blind, man. It's awesome hunting right here. And drops down back here about 250, 300 yards, goes right into the Manistee River Bayou. And I knew all the area really well. I'd hunted it with him for grouse and all that stuff, you know. I'm sitting in the blind one morning and, oh, I got back there a little late. It was probably about 5 a.m. I usually was in my blind by 4 o'clock. I just loved being sitting out there in the dark and the quiet and everything, you know. And I'm sitting there and daylight comes on and uh, I don't know, it's probably somewhere around eight thirty, nine o'clock. And I hadn't really seen much of anything, heard much of anything. And I'm looking down through the woods and all of a sudden I noticed something out of place. And then it was back in there. It was back in there quite a ways, probably at least 200 yards. And uh, before the drop off though, and I'm looking, I'm like, what in the hell is that? And I'm like, well, another one of the times I happened to have my seven mag that I was using. So I carefully got the long gun that it is up move around the blind and got it on a good rest and I'm dialing it in looking looking down through there and I'm like oh that's a bobcat okay no he's probably 12 15 feet off the ground on a broken off section of tree and he's but he's backing up it and I'm like wait a minute why in the hell is he backing up that tree in an aggressive manner like he's watching something on the ground and I caught moving on the ground below and I'm like what in the hell is he watching? That's not a deer. I guarantee you that's not a deer. And I, I kept seeing the movement and then it passed by and was passing. And as it was passing by this bobcat, this bobcat kept backing more and more up that tree, but it was watching it from a different angle. And I knew in my mind again, right there. And then I'm like, Oh my God, here he is. Please come this way. If you do, I'm going to whack you. And as I was watching it going through there, it looked at first like another hunter that didn't have no orange on or anything. And I'm like, that's not a hunter. Because whatever this is, isn't very far from that bobcat in height. And by maybe three or four feet. And I'm like, this is no hunter. I know exactly in my mind what this is. So I know in my mind, people can say what they want. I never got an actual good visual on it. But the way it was moving through there. And the way that bobcat was backing up that tree, uh, I knew. But yeah. that's all I can say. You know how how far as far as the crow flies are you hunting from where you grew up? Well, by the way, the crow flies in those two locations, I was probably not more than twenty miles. So pretty close. I mean, relatively. Yeah, and I'm and I'm not more than. By the way, the crow flies right now at best of ten to twelve miles of where I grew up, where those encounters all took place. Do you have any ambitions to see another one? Absolutely. Yeah. I, well, I hope to, I hope to have the chance to take one out, you know, personally. Yeah. And, and you and I are on the same page as that. Not everyone is, but I'm definitely with you on that. What do you think that they are? Well, th th there is no thinking on, on the one end of it. It's, to me, that's a two part question. And here's, here's my answer for that. On the one end of it, there is no question. It's a flesh and blood creature. No hands down not even up for discussion where that evolved from. That's where the question comes in. Was it Gigantopithecus from the Bible times is a, a human bred with an ape? I don't know. I've, I've that, that's the, that's the side of it that, that really intrigues me the most is where, where did it come from? Probably been here longer than any of us. You know, I'm assuming, I don't know, but, uh, the flesh and blood part of it, that's not even up for discussion. That's exactly what it is. It's a flesh and blood creature, hands down. Where it comes from, how it got here, how long it's been here, that's the mystery for me. 
What do you make of, you know, when you're out there hunting and everything goes quiet, even the insects go quiet, you experience that and you know something's watching you. I mean, that just seems, you know, a cougar could be watching you. I don't know that we'd pick up a cougar watching us. Maybe. I don't know. Um, but what do you make of that feeling of I'm being watched and everything just got quiet? That's a hair raising experience. Um, unless someone has experienced that, which I believe you probably have, that's a hair raising experience is the easiest way for me to describe it. That's an automatic reaction. I reach for my, my uh, pistol that I always carry. I've carried for 25 years at least. Um, or, or, you know, I'm automatically on my 300 mag or seven mag or 300 ultra, whatever I have for a weapon at the time. I'm on my kind of safety and I'm looking because I know when things go that quiet, I've been in that position for and experienced it. I know something's there. It may not be where I can see it yet. I don't know if it's up in a tree, if it's on the ground, I'm looking everywhere. But when the, when that sets in and everything goes eerily quiet, I react immediately, you know, cause I'm never going to take the chance that. I'm not going to be pulverized or, you know, otherwise attacked by one of these, you know, like I said, in my mind, a grizzly bear doesn't stand a chance. Yeah. I would probably agree with you on that. Why do you think the government's covering it up? (laughs) I don't know. It could be many things in that rabbit hole of, uh, of discussion. You know, the government's always been good about lying to people. They've always been good about covering up for their own reasons. But if you go into, into conspiracies of thoughts of process of chaos and pandemonium, that's my biggest thing that I've ever come up with. If they were to allow this to be exposed to the public, could one imagine the pandemonium and chaos that would ensue on many levels? Do you really, that's, my big, that's my biggest belief. You know. Do you really think that there would be chaos? I guess it all comes down to well, what they are, which might cause well, chaos. Well, what I'm saying is like the people that would all of a sudden go, oh, my God, they're they're admitting that they're real. They, we could have one on our property. Let's, let's go hunting for it. Let's be buying ammo. Let's be buying guns. People might go off the charts and start getting ridiculous about it. So some people, you know, live in this fear factor. They live in their own bubble. They're automatically going to go, just like the COVID, they just panic, go shit. Like, it's crazy, you know. Um, so I'm, I'm always been, it's my big thing. I think the government worries that how much chaos or pandemonium and fear that could cause if they were to actually allow it to be exposed. I got you. In the meantime, though, they're putting a lot of people at risk by making a joke of it. Oh, absolutely. And to me, that's, that's beyond hideous of that to do that beyond hideous. And, you know, it's just like the UFO cover up the JFK cover up any of it. That's beyond hideous to hide any of that. That's, that's wrong to do that to the American people, you know? Yeah, tell tell me about the UFO you saw. It was back in the gravel pits uh, when we lived at the uh, farm back there in the 70s, at the same time when, you know, my encounters had all taken place. We were playing in the field one night, real, real close to where I had seen the infants and the adult. We were playing hide and go seek. Now, one time I was just playing out in the fields in the dark at night, and a bunch of kids had took off and was heading for the house, and they're like, well, let's go up to the house and get something to eat or something to drink or whatever. And I just, ah, no, I'm just going to wander around here in the dark and, you know, do my thing. And I'll be up to the house in a few minutes. Out of nowhere, I remember, like, behind me, casting a shadow in front of me, because it was, like, all lit up behind me. And I turned around and looked, and I was probably eight, nine years old, you know. I turned around and looked, and I seen this great big, what I believed, and what it appeared to be, by all pretense and purpose, a saucer in the sky, and it was down quite low, and it had lights that were spinning around on the outer edges of it. And I'm like, what in the hell is that? You know? And I'm looking at it going, well, that's not an airplane because they're not round. And I sat there looking at it and it like came down real close and it sat there for a few seconds and it went way up high in the sky, like in an instant. It was, it was way up high in the sky and it was light, but it was lighting up the whole area. Like it was daylight or more. And I'm like, Whoa, it's time for me to go. And uh, I turned around, looked at it again as I was running for the house, and it was even higher in the sky this time. And it wasn't lighting up the area nearly as much. And it was basically back to darkness, and other than the move that night. And I was just, I hightailed it for the house. I'm like, ain't nobody going to believe what I just seen. And it just came out of nowhere, completely out of nowhere. Now, I know my wife's had encounters with, like, UFO-type stuff, too, as a kid. 
Um, but that was my only one experience with what I believe was a UFO as a kid, you know. Did it make so, a noise? Did you hear a sound? No, the only thing that I really ever remember hearing from the UFO or what I believe was a UFO was humming. Um, and it's kind of a strange humming, but it wasn't like any sirens or motor noises. It was like electric type of humming, just kind of a hmm, hmm, hmm. And that was when it was down closer, but when it was up high, I didn't, higher, I didn't hear that. So. And, and let me ask you, uh, Scott, what, what do you think uh, UFOs and aliens, what do you think that they really are? I think if you ask most Americans, they will, they say that they believe in aliens and UFOs. Now, back when you saw it, you know, you were crazy if you saw a UFO. Today, not so much. But what do you think that they are? Well, I, I firm believe that aliens and UFOs are definitely connected and they're just uh, forms of life from other planets. Um, I don't know if they so much directly own the earth but i believe that they visit us regularly i believe that uh, they have a right to be here otherwise we'd be doing something to stop it um do i believe in them completely absolutely um th but they're another form of life i don't know if it's interdimensional or what it is exactly but they're another form of life on another planet whether it's pluto mars whatever it might be and um they're just just as common as we are that's my belief. I've always believed that ever since, ever since I saw that saucer come down in light of, you know, the field that night. So yeah, I believe they're just as real as you and I sitting here talking. Oh, I you agree. Know, I, yeah, no, I agree. You know, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, that, it's amazing accounts and I'm so glad that, uh, you took the time to come on, Scott. I, when I was talking to Rick, I was like, man, I hope you hear from you. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, you know, growing yeah, up. Yeah, episode 543 really, really got me intrigued. And I was like, whoa, I about fell out of my chair. I'm like, now tell me I'm nuts. You know? So, but. Yeah, no, I appreciate you listening. And I appreciate Rick coming on. And thank you so much for taking the time and, and coming on. and Because it's very personal. Encounters are very personal. And you learn something, uh, I think, with every encounter and Yours are definitely fascinating, especially the little kids playing. Uh, that's, I'm still thinking about that. Um, but I really appreciate you taking the time to come on. Hey, not a problem, Wes. It was great talking with you. Have a good night, buddy. Oh, like I said, it was great talking with you, Scott. And uh, you have a great night as well. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. And if you get a chance, check out SasquatchChronicles.com. You can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.